Look, what I wanted to do today was just give you a couple of stories. Um, we're, uh, depending on what day it is, we're one of Australia's biggest fund managers. You've got to look at the stock market these days to see whether you still have a lot of money under management. Um, but we have about $150 billion worth of um, essentially your money and your superannuation funds under management. Um, we have about uh, $4 billion of that in uh, unlisted, what we call unlisted infrastructure. And it's quite an important distinction I think we should make in relation to investment because climate change is a long-term thing. The joy I have is that I'm actually uh, involved in a space that has very long-term views. As an unlisted player, we can tend to take a longer-term view than, than those of our, our brothers and sisters who invest in the equities market, which tends to take a, uh, these days, I think Gareth was saying, a three-second view on the algorithms they use to trade equities, which is um, quite disturbing when you think about trying to make business decisions in that context. Um, just as a way of a bit of background, I'm not going to lecture on climate change, but I think one of the impor most important things to note, and it's been mentioned before, and I think um, Mark certainly mentioned it, there is a difference between climate variability, which in Australia we have a lot of, and certainly around the world there are a lot more extremes, and climate change. Um, our businesses are quite adapted to uh, managing climate variability. We do it on a daily basis, a yearly basis, a, in, in infrastructure on a decade and, and a centurion basis, but um, climate change is a different perspective on climate variability. It is that Climate variability is almost business as usual. We're used to it, we're aware of it, we know it changes uh, on a, you know, within a certain set of parameters. Climate change is actually changing those parameters, the fundamentals on which we actually make business decisions. Um, and there's some other bits and pieces there which I won't go into. How does climate change impact infrastructure? Well, effectively, there's four components to it. There's an exposure component, um, so the stimuli that affect, and I'll show you some rather interesting pictures in a sec that will put it all in perspective, but it's the exposure infrastructure assets have to, to, these, um, to these changes. Sensitivity as well, some of our infrastructure assets are far more resilient than others to, to some of the climate change or climate events that can occur. And that's different in different parts of the world based on different regulation, different standards, different operational approaches, different safety standards, for example. Vulnerability, so uh, the sense to which uh, a system or an asset can adapt to that change, how vulnerable it is to change um, is a critical component to this, and how able we are to, the final one, ad adaptation, how able we are to change assets. Now, big infrastructure assets, when you build a road, it's built. It's very difficult to actually make changes to that. When you put in a new runway at an airport, it's built, and it's there for 100 years. It's very difficult to make changes to big infrastructure. So the adaptation component to infrastructure for climate change is a really critical business decision for a very, very long-term horizon. Um, Here's a, a couple of examples. That's Rockhampton on the right-hand side, uh, not landing planes that day, for a good reason. Uh, and I think that's Gibraltar on the left-hand side. So they're, I think, praying that the, the sea levels don't rise by probably 10 centimetres by the look of that elevation there. Every time I come to Melbourne, I don't know whether they're building this or pulling it down. <laughs> so are, are they building this or pulling it down? I don't know. Um, they've obviously had some problems with this, um, particularly related to heat stress. Um, but I think also the wind blew a bit hard one day, and so they had to pull it down again. And so it's fascinating. Actually, it's a tourist attraction in itself. You don't actually have to ride it to get <laughs> some value out of it. Two very different extremes here. On the right-hand side, your very own train system here, using a very high-tech climate change mitigation tool, a garden hose. Um, obviously, heat stress there in the rail system, causing some problems with the rail. And on the left-hand side there, you can see uh, a completely opposite problem, but business as usual for Mumbai. They don't seem to care that the train is half underwater, nor the people on it, for that matter, who are hanging out the doors. This also provides a sort of perspective on the fact that in Australia, we're certainly not operating in that environment. We're not allowed to, but over there they can do that. So the way infrastructure adapts to these sorts of things is different based on different regulatory regimes and different operating parameters as well. Um, that's a toll road in Canada on the left-hand side. And I couldn't find a closed school, but I know it's very topical at the moment because I think the teachers are going on strike today. So I hope your kids, you, you, you haven't got any kids, have you? Because otherwise you'd be at home, is that right? So, um, but certainly um, extreme weather events certain, uh, affect critical infrastructure like schools because if it's too hot and they don't have appropriate facilities, kids don't go to school. Now, a couple of stories. Um, it's a good example. We are for our sins, an owner of an asset which is very topical at the moment. You would have seen it in the papers yesterday on the front page of the papers. We have a legacy investment in Hazelwood Power Station. Um, the two examples I want to give today are assets that are sort of reactively adapting or man trying to manage the climate change environment. Um, the second example is Brisbane Airport, which is um, a far more proactive example of what's happening in the business decision-making space around adaptation. 
Uh, most of you know Hazelwood Power Station, a very, very important um, component, critical infrastructure in Australia, a very, very dirty, what we call dirty, um, contributor to the climate problem in that context. 18 million tonnes of carbon every year. It's effectively burning wet dirt, um, but providing very, very cheap power. So on an average day, Australia's power is about half the price of American power and a third the price of European power. This is the reason for that. It comes with uh, a problem, which is its contribution to the carbon emissions in the atmosphere, but it is also a critical piece of infrastructure. It provides 25% of Victoria's electricity. So I think last year, if Hazelwood wasn't operating, the lights would have gone out on four separate days, which of course is politically uh, and economically unpalatable. And it provides 8% of Australia's power. Uh, mostly through the East Coast. Interestingly enough, uh, in 2005, Hazelwood, we received a, a Greenhouse Office Large Business Award, which sounds like a bit of a contradiction as one of Australia's biggest carbon polluters. But I'll get onto it in a sec. This is, the, this is the way Hazelwood's gone about its business in trying to adapt. It's not necessarily the fact that Hazelwood is a sustainable asset in a carbon context. It's what business is doing at Hazelwood in their operational sense to try and make it a better asset, and that's adaptation. It's not making, as uh, Gareth would like us all to do, ethical decisions, it's about making business decisions. Unfortunately, um, as a fiduciary, managing your money, I don't have uh, the power to make ethical decisions. My first responsibility as a director on a, on a number of companies, and as a fiduciary in charge of um, your money effectively, is to make fiduciary decisions, which is um, unfortunately not ethical decisions. But uh, in the same sense, we believe at Colonial, and as Gareth says, we do, we do a lot in this space, we believe Good sustainable practices lead to better business, and I'll get onto that a little bit later. Um, we we're also, interestingly enough, in 2005, granted approvals to keep mining until 2030, which I don't, we're not so sure will happen anymore. A beautiful future golf course. That's actually the uh, the mine, and as you can see, it's um, it's um, surface mining, so it's basically just scraping the the dirt or the coal off the surface and put and and burning it effectively. Up. Oh. But what have we done down there? So this is, this is what we call a low carbon transition. Now, all of this has changed. So this is, let's pretend it's five years ago because it's all changed recently and you would have read the papers about our difficulties in getting a refinance and um, the government wanting to close us down through contract for close process, which we're more than amenable to have those discussions about. Let's go back five years and pretend I'm talking in 2006. What were we doing? Well, we had a relatively restricted social licence to operate. So there was always a guy dressed in a koala suit at the front of the gate saying, close it down. So every, guy, every worker who turned up that day felt bad about going to work. There was a lot of um, social and moral pressure on Hazelwood to uh, discontinue operations because of the way it operates. Um, so we explored a move to uh, a low carbon operating environment. And what you see on the right there, it's, it's funny, some of the things you see at Hazelwood you'd expect to see in a science lab somewhere, but um, Hazelwood, funnily enough, has contributed quite extensively to the sort of growth in learning and what you can do in a low carbon transition. That is a biodiesel algae, from memory, which we were using the waste heat from Hazelwood to grow effectively and trying to make um, the energy cycle at Hazelwood more efficient in that context. So um, biofuels is a really interesting perspective when you're talking about burning coal. It's not necessarily about ne only producing electricity to go into the grid. You, can, you produce a whole bunch of other things, including latent heat. You can use that to do other things, and biofuels is one of those things. There's options. We've also got Australia's only functioning carbonation facility, so we make chalk. So we take carbon, turn it into chalk, and we can then, and therefore, we've got embedded carbon, which doesn't go into the atmosphere. It sits in the ground in chalk. And we've done a whole bunch of um, analysis around repowering or refuelling. So we burn, we have on the odd occasion burnt waste wood um, down there, so we were, which has a lower carbon intensity than the wet brown coal. Uh, and we've also looked at a whole range and spent hundreds of millions of dollars, by the way, on energy efficiency um, programs at the, at the power station as well. So look, a bad story with a lot of good outcomes. Um, it's still not a good investment story going forward. There's, there's no sort of social licence to operate prerogative for Hazelwood and at some point in time it will it will be decommissioned but you can't just turn it off. It'll be hopefully a, an orderly transition out of brown coal into something more um, longer term sustainable, a mix of renewables and, and some baseload fuel like gas. But a fascinating case study. Please don't ask me any questions about it today. Uh, Brisbane Airport is another more positive example. We are, we are the largest owner of Brisbane Airport. Um, it's a big airport. On, even on a global scale, Brisbane Airport, the east coast of Australia, has some very large airports. It's 20 million passengers per annum, and when you translate that into aeroplanes, it's a lot, and a lot of big aeroplanes. 
it's Australia's second largest gateway airport, so uh, international gateway, um, and third largest overall domestic and, and international as well. It's a massive site and it sits right on the bay, in Moreton Bay. So that comes with a number of its own challenges, which I'll get onto. It's also, um, it also has, given it sits on the swamp there, major biodiversity zones associated with it as well. The example I want to give today is this um, concept around the second runway. Brisbane has a single runway, which you can see on the right hand side there. The circle is around the proposed new runway. So this is a concept diagram, don't panic, it's not there yet, if you have a house around Brisbane Airport. Um, this is what's proposed to be built. Now, this is, this is one of those examples of an infrastructure asset that will be a 100 year vision. This, this thing will be there for, for over 100 years and will provide capacity to the airport for another 100 years. So making decisions now, we have to look over that time horizon. It's a very interesting business debate to have with the people who actually physically use the airport. So in essence, the airlines and those people who catch planes, um, the airline users, because we say to the airlines, well, we're going to build this runway slightly differently because we sit at the convergence of a number of climate change risks, a flood zone, a swamp in a bay with uh, rising sea levels and changing surge, uh, storm surge patterns. So on a bad day, if you had all of those things happen at once, this thing would be completely underwater. Having said that, on a little more positive note, we did just have a, I think it was a one in 50 or one in 100 year event in Queensland, and we didn't lose a single day's operation here. But in looking at the second runway, that's not what we're looking at. We're not looking at what happens normally, that climate variability thing, we're not looking at what happens normally here. We know what happens normally, we built that runway and it worked. What we're looking at now for the second runway is what, how things are going to change. Do we just build another one of those right hand runways again? And the answer, we're still uncertain, but the answer is likely to be slightly no. Um, the right-hand runway did survive a rather large flood event, but we didn't also have a king tide with a storm surge on a bad day. So it's all sort of double jeopardy, triple jeopardy things here. You're talking about trying to manage these assets when the very worst things, um, very worst things happen together in relation to climate change. The other issue here in the business context is can we do things? If the airport is off for a day, and we lose, I'm just making up a number here, so don't quote me, if we lose $2 million because we're off for the day, no planes can land because the runways are underwater, do we have insurance? And do we really care if it's underwater? Well, there's two separate decisions there. If we have insurance, that's fine, we'll get paid. And as an investor, that's fine, we get paid. But as an operator of critical infrastructure, it is completely unacceptable for people not to be able to land at Brisbane Airport for an hour. You'll know what happens if, if your plane's late for 10 minutes, you get angry. Imagine if you can't land for a day or two or three. And that's certainly happened in recent experience with the Queensland floods at airports like Rockhampton where their runways are underwater. It's a complete disruption to the normal economic functioning of, of Australia and, and internationally, particularly with these international gateways. Um, enormous investment, $1.3 billion for a piece of tarmac. So it's just extraordinary expenditure on these things. Now, I, I still can't remember the day, I, I've been involved in oil and gas too, so I should know they're the biggest projects in the world. I still can't remember the day when it went from hundreds of millions of dollars for a big project to, we don't talk about hundreds of millions anymore talk about billions and this is an example, this is really just a piece of bitumen and yet it's going to cost us $1.3 billion. Eight years to lay a piece of bitumen, two of those is settling, it's in a swamp so they've got to fill it and they've got to fill it higher than it needs to be because it'll sink into the swamp and there's some smart engineers in the room here, I think you guys are pretty underpaid. Some of the smarts that go into this are more complicated than anything that happens in finance or law or tax or whatever, this is really rocket science stuff here. This is trying to work out how a swamp will take the weight of an A380 on a 45 second basis for 100 years. It's quite extraordinary what they do. It's 3.3 um, kilometres long, um, so you can see the, the safety zone. You, you probably don't want to fly off the end of this thing, it's, it, you'll get wet. Um, and it's only four metres above sea level, so it sits right on Moreton Bay and it's not dissimilar to Sydney's elevation really here uh, in, in Sydney. Um, it's really quite close to, to that sea level point. So even a metre change when you talk about sea level rises may not seem like a problem because we're four levels, four metres above, but when you add that to storm surge and tidal events and floods all happening at the same time, it's a, a bit of a drama. And you can see there the scale of it, it's a 11 million cubic metres of fill, which will get out of Moreton Bay, hopefully at some point in time. So these are all of the design considerations, um, extremely complicated. It's taken a long time to get there and the business decision has been an even more interesting argument. So aside from all of the complex engineering stuff that's going on just to get this thing done, the negotiation to actually get it funded is extraordinarily difficult. We're talking to airlines who say, why should we pay for something that we may never use? If we happen to need to raise this runway another half a metre, which would add another, say, $100 million cost to the $1.3 billion, the airport, we don't, as, as asset owners, we don't actually pay for our stuff, all the users do. So it's either paid for by governments or by the users. And that's how critical infrastructure in Australia is funded. 
So we say to the airlines, we're changing the design of this runway because we believe in 45 years the sea level will be slightly higher and we want to protect this runway from a storm surge event in a 1 in 50 year flood. And in, if those things happen it will be underwater, we don't want it underwater. And then the airline has to go away and have its own thinking about whether it wants to pay the extra $100 million over time as a user of that facility and whether they believe us. So then we start having, it's not that they don't believe, I'm not trying to cast aspersions on the airline industry that they're climate sceptics or anything, it's not that they don't necessarily believe that climate change is happening, but then we start having this debate about the extent to which climate change is happening. And so then there's this sort of difference in the language and, and potentially the, the outcomes of who's arguing what in relation to climate change because someone's got to pay for it and someone's got to provide it and that may not necessarily match. Um, and we haven't won that argument yet and uh, the government may have to step in and actually have that discussion with us um, in a regulated asset. That's what happens when two private users can't come to an agreement in that context. But we used all of the right science in relation to this, uh, I say right science, available science in relation to this, um, modelling things like one in 100 year events at 2020, uh, 2100, um, using all of these models um, to try and give us an outcome on, on what it would look like. We've got full approvals to do this from the federal and state government, so in essence the, the government sort of tacitly said yes that makes sense in that context. We're having the discussions with the users of the airports, hopefully they'll come around and say yes that makes sense, trying to bring everyone together to get a common um, story around a climate change and what it actually means for business and operation. Um, major upgrades to other things as well. So it's not just the runway we're talking about here at the airport, we're talking about protection all along Moreton Bay there um, in relation to seawalls. There's a huge amount of work to be done on the drainage systems there. And actually, to sing its praises, the management at Brisbane Airport have just completed a water saving initiative, which is interesting, slightly off topic, but they spent a large amount of money to completely redesign the airport to do grey water capture, storm water capture and all that sort of stuff. They spent about $8 million um, and it has, it's going to save 80% of potable water use. So some of the, getting the right culture in businesses to think about this sort of stuff is critical in getting that climate change um, business decision making framework in place, just as they would analyse their legal or tax or operational risks. They now have to actually consider these risks and embed them into their decision making processes. Now, as Gareth said, I'm also, I sit on the board of uh, the Australian Green Infrastructure Council. Um, so this, this is not a cash for comment type arrangement here. I mean, it's actually a not-for-profit organisation. I'm not paid to do it. We love this. Um, we think this is a great idea. As an asset owner, we're desperate to try and understand a risk assessment framework around sustainability generally, but as you can see here, um, climate change vulnerability particularly. Um, this tool is one of the ways that business will actually start to think more together so if the airlines were using this, if we were using this, then everyone would come together with the same language and actually have that discussion. There would be a basis for benchmarking that discussion around best practice. And Gareth was talking before about the, uh, the financial review saying that innovation has died in Australia. Well, this is the sort of thing that will bring back innovation. This is all about talking, do, doing things smarter. We cannot make business decisions that do not make us money. It's not smart business. So in some way, shape or form, the decisions we make at this business as a fiduciary have to make money. So innovation is that critical component that turns any decision you make around sustainability or even more specifically climate change vulnerability into a profitable decision. And having the tools in place and the frameworks in place to do that um, are actually critical to actually getting those risks managed, priced in essence, whether you can do it with a quantitative analysis or a qualitative analysis, and then built into your decision making process to get an outcome. The tool looks at screening of projects to identify whether they've got sensitivity, so it's actually a risk assessment framework. Um, it's a credibility, so it's like the Green Star building rating, you can actually go out in the industry and say, we are doing this, it's not business as usual. This tool won't give you a rating if you're doing business as usual. This tool will only give you a rating if you're doing better than business as usual. And that's the smart way to do climate change. If you're doing better than what everyone else is doing, then you're actually one step ahead of this on the, you know, on the profit curve. Um, it does a whole bunch of other things. I won't go into too much detail because I think Gareth's about to kick me in the bum, but uh, if anyone needs any more information about this, um, there's a website associated with it. We are trying to get industry to get this, to get this and adapt uh, and bring it in. And the government has provided um, more than ample support for this. We've got a lot of government funding from um, Department of Climate Change and New South Wales Department of Climate Change, et cetera. And we're very excited about what this will actually bring to, to the business approach to climate change. Thank you.